Um, last thing, I'm, well, I'm whipping through this. Um, the, other, the key documents that you need if you're gonna do a private offering, you're gonna get money for your marijuana business, um, what do you need? Well, you know, you're gonna need a promissory note, or if it's equity, you need an operating agreement. Um, you don't necessarily need like stock certificates, membership certificates, things like that. What other documents are you gonna need? You're gonna need probably SEC Form D. That's probably a, 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 um, that's a form that needs to be filed for most of the safe harbors you're gonna try to use for an offering. Um, there, are, there are several different pieces of Reg D, several different exemptions you can rely on. Most of them require a Form D filing with the SEC. Um, in some cases, that also needs to be filed at the state level. Uh, and what other documents do you need? Subscription documents, also very important. Um, subscription documents are gonna include a subscription agreement always. Sometimes they're also gonna include an investor questionnaire um, because for some exemptions from the securities laws, you need to actually do some follow-up work to make sure that the person you're, that you're uh, taking uh, shares from is accredited. Um, and let, let's go back to that because I kind of skipped that, the first half of the slide here. Um, here is the securities laws are, are, are very technical. The exemptions, there are a whole bunch of them. They all have different quirks, different requirements. Um, and I could go through them in nauseating detail, but it'd be like a day long seminar. You can, you can look it up, you can find a chart, you can find a, that it'll, show, that'll list them all under Reg D and other sections of the Securities Act. But here's what you, the, the practical stuff you need to tell a client or the practical thing you need to know if you're a business person and you're going out to raise money. The easiest, the way to make your life easy is to always deal with accredited investors. Always deal with accredited investors. So accredited investors are, this is the federal definition. It's um, nutshell, it's someone who's worth a million bucks or has $200,000 of annual income or $300,000 together with their spouse. There are some other tricks to qualifying as an accredited investor under how that rule works. So, you know, that's, don't just rely on just the, you know, the two sentences I just spilled out. But the main way that you avoid a problem in, you know, with securities laws when you're going out to raise funds for a business is you just stick to accredited investors. You can, you can go down and you can get money from folks that are under that level, but you, you, there are a lot of hoops to jump through to do that. Um, roughly speaking, what's gonna happen if you try to get money from an, uh, a, a person who's not accredited is your attorney's gonna say, you need a, a private placement memorandum and you need some audited financial statements. Audited financial statements. Um, can you do it with unaudited financial statements? I, I, I wouldn't, I mean, you, you could, it's pretty risky. Um, so that's where, that's where this stuff gets expensive. Um, so the private placement memorandum, that's a document 15, 20, 30, 40, 50 pages long. It's gonna have a bunch of securities disclosures in it. It's gonna have a bunch of you know, information about the business. Um, a lot of you have probably seen one before. Um, the, uh, uh, the client uh, we worked with before who was um, investing in a medical marijuana business, um, he had received prescription documents from the, the folks who were at, he was just an investor in the business, he wasn't actually running it. Um, we had a full blown uh, private place memorandum for that deal, which was a smart thing to do. Um, if, you're, if you're raising you know, uh, upwards of a million bucks, um, it's worth it to do a private placement memorandum, e even if you're not required to do it. You know, so, so some folks will do private equity deals, and there are some small private equity firms in town. You, you might have heard of some of these deals, or or, or have uh, had clients who invested in them. Um, you know, one to ten, fifteen, twenty, thirty million dollar deals. They're raising money. Um, even they're usually only dealing with accredited investors, and you could do that deal without doing a PPM, but the private equity firms don't do that because it's, it's risky. They, they've got some capital set aside. They will put together a private placement memorandum. That's probably, you know, I don't know. You, I, you, can, you can do one for legal fees for that or what, three to $5,000, maybe 10 if it's a really complicated offering just for the PPM, a little bit more for the subscription documents. Um, and so that's pretty easy to do. The financial statements are a little trickier. Getting an audit is, is, is pretty expensive. And you're probably thinking, well, if it's a startup company, why do I need an audit? You, you can go without an audit. It's just riskier. Um, and that's, that's sort of the name of the game. Um, I'm talking really fast here because we were running out of time. Um, but this, this is important stuff to know. 
Um, there, as far as the medical marijuana business, um, how, how, is the, how is it different if you're starting a medical marijuana business versus any other kind of business? I mean, this stuff doesn't, doesn't really change. Um, there, it's, 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 it's the same stuff um, for any other startup company. And I think we can probably, okay. I, there's one more thing I got to talk about because this actually happened. Like, like this deal still isn't over. It's going on right now. Finders, okay. If you have if you have a client who says, "Hey, I, I got a guy who says he, he can help me raise money. Um, he knows some people who have money. Um, can I just you know can I just do like cut him like two percent of the or ten percent or whatever of the raise and he'll just go find the investors for me. I don't have to go find them." Uh, the answer is pr uh, probably not unless they're licensed and affiliated with an investment banking firm. Okay, um, they, they call themselves finders, um, and there's this thing in the securities laws called the finders exception, which is this really narrow exception from having to get registered as a broker dealer or as a securities, uh, a seller of securities. Um, it's an extremely narrow ex exception that a lot of the investment bankers out there in the world don't understand. And there's sort of like an old, like an old wives' tale that it's, it covers more than it really does. It doesn't cover very much stuff. So if you have a client who calls and says they've got somebody who's willing to do that, you need to put the brakes on and say, look, is that person licensed and are they affiliated with a broker dealer? So they need like a Series 7, a Series 63, something like that, and they need to be affiliated with a broker dealer, someone who has a broker dealer license, or else both of you could get in trouble. It's not. It's not just on, you, you might think it's just on that, that person who's running around trying to act like a finder, they're the one that's gonna get nailed, but your client could also get nailed if that person's running around without the license and drumming up money for your business. Especially, obviously, especially if the deal falls apart, especially if your company goes belly up, right? So um, that's an important one to be aware of because that's, that's gonna, if you're working with startup companies, that's gonna happen to you. One day, one of your clients is gonna run into that problem. Um, and then safes, okay, who's heard of a safe? No? Okay, so this is, these have been around for four or five years maybe. One of the uh, startup companies out in Silicon Valley, Y Combinator, which like kind of helps startups, um, they came up with this new, totally new instrument, um, uh, didn't exist before, called a safe, Simple Agreement for Future Equity. It's basically a contract, and remember what I said earlier, if it's a contract and there's investment involved, it's a security. Um, so that's security. Um, there are really strange things. They're basically like, it's kind of like getting preferred shares or convertible debt, except it's not debt. And, and the big thing there is it's not debt. Um, the reason that it's gotten to be so popular is because, um, you know, startup companies, you know, they don't want debt. I mean, that's scary, right? It's, who wants debt? You don't want it on your balance sheet. You don't want it, period, because it's enforceable. Um, so. What's going on is we've got, out in the VC world, people are just throwing money. You know, venture capitalists will throw money at 10 different deals assuming that nine of them are gonna fail. And only one of them, and they're gonna make all their money back on, on, the, on the 10th one. And they do it, that, I mean, that's like an entire industry. That's just, that's what they do. So what happened is after spending years of you know, issuing convertible debt in those situations or preferred shares in those situations, finally somebody said, you know, most of those these deals just fail, and why do I need to have why do I need to have debt against a company that just went bankrupt? Like most, if the startup fails and it doesn't have any assets, what's the point of having the debt? So that's the new trend: is okay, everyone, everyone, all the venture capitalists are taking these things called simple agreements for future equity. Um, that could raise, that could rear its head in, in the medical marijuana fundraising world very easily. Um, uh, I don't. I'm not crazy about them. They're good for businesses. They're good for the business owners. They're not good for the investors. Um, so we'll kind of watch that and see how it plays out. Um, all right, lightning round's over. A any questions? Yes. So that, that's, that's one of the requirements um, of doing it legally, is to not actually, you can't be at all, you can't be participating at all in negotiating. You, you aren't even supposed to help prepare slide decks, which is the problem our client, I, I, you know, I asked him, I said, well, what's this guy gonna do? He knows he needs a license. Well, he's gonna, you know, he's gonna help prepare the slide deck, he can't help prepare the slide deck. You can't do that. 
Um, the specifics of the rest of that, I honestly, I honestly don't know because that's licensing is kind of like a whole separate. Like there are securities lawyers that all they do is licensing, um, and then there are people like me who kind of like all we do is just sort of the deal side, the, the equity raise. But but that is part of it. Now, if you, if they're getting a, a percentage of the equity raise, that's going to be a problem too. Even if you even if they are completely uninvolved. I mean, and put it in perspective for you, even our law firm we're extremely careful about even connecting investors with investment opportunities. We almost never do it. We've done it like once in the last year because it's not, it's really, I mean, it, you should really have a license to, to do that. So even when, you know, when, even when we have permission from our clients to do it, it we, we don't like to do that. Um, so it, but yeah, just introducing someone, hey, meet so-and-so, you know, that, okay. I mean, what are they going to do, you know? So that, that, that is part of that exception. Um, any other questions? Great. All right, uh, back to Nick if we have a little bit. Of, do we have uh, time? Well, I want to say two very quick things, uh -oh. and then I want to talk with you after about the expenses. I know you had questions. Um, uh, I want to talk about uh, insurance really quickly. Um, there's a whole lot here. Uh, the upshot is it's not clear that it's enforceable for any kind of marijuana business. Um, and there's a whole bunch of a whole bunch I can go in for that. There are places that you can find that will insure you. Whether those contracts are enforceable hasn't really been litigated yet in Ohio. Um, the uh, Cannabis Chamber of Commerce has a whole bunch of them if you're trying to find them, but it's possible your own insurance company does it. Um, and finally, I, I understand that it is possible that some people are here because uh, they want to skip the line and they just want to buy an existing business. Um, you can certainly do that, and Nate can help you do that. Uh, just remember that you can't buy a provisional license. That's non-transferable. It can only be a certificate of operation only, and you have to do the complete application again. So you can't just buy the certificate. You have to go through the entire application process and get that uh, approved. Um, and we are way out of time. Uh, I'm happy to talk with anyone out in the hall uh, for any other questions. But uh, again, uh, Nick Weiss, Nate Haskell from the Gertzford Law Firm, and thank you for your time.